they said, we're sending you to Kenya. Uh, they were crying, they were laughing, they were fighting. Sorry? How is your Spanish? Still crap. Foreign sales reps selling mm -hmm. medicine at, at Zhongshan Hospital. Oh, wow. I think it's, a, it's definitely a difficult environment for, for foreigners. Thank you, Matt, for joining me. Thanks, Marion. It's fun to be in the car with you. <laughs> as a way to work. As I always do, I'm checking first LinkedIn profile and see what you did, what you did before, where did you work. And um, one of the sentences that actually I remembered that was, um, your lifetime goal is to bring education to remote places in, in, in the world. How did you come up with this? Is it something spontaneous or someone inspired you? How did it happen? Um, I'd say it's still very much a dream because I, I, I think about it, but I haven't acted on it as much as I would like. There's no real business behind it. But um, about 15 years ago, I was backpacking through Asia and uh, I started teaching at a school for about a month up in the foothills of the Himalayas. And um, yeah, what I learned there were, you know, five, six year old students that were trekking three or four miles through the jungle to get to school, I thought there's a huge gap here. Um, so I don't know if it's actual schools that I want to build or just learning facilities where they're technology enabled. Um, so they don't need to go to walk so far to get to school every day. Maybe they only come to the school once or twice a week, but the rest of the time they, they have some self-learning mechanism um, closer to home. So, so I guess everything that you're doing now take you a little bit closer to that it's dream. related yeah <laughs> and also i checked that you spent some time in africa um why did you go there it's kind of interesting um choice at that time i guess yeah so um back in university i wanted to spend a semester abroad and i had a few choices but um actually ecuador was my first choice and unfortunately my spanish wasn't good enough so i didn't get into the program and when i went to meet the the, the college counselor, they said, we're sending you to Kenya. And I, I thought, okay, that's, that's different and exciting. <laughs> um, never thought I would end up there. But yeah, I spent four months in Kenya, Uganda, um, studying environmental economics and working at Microfinance Bank up in Mount Meru district. Um, it was really kind of wild experience because the people in my host village never seen a foreigner before. Um, so I, I really made a point to, to kind of say hello to everybody because I thought this is my chance to leave a lasting impression. They either think foreigners are bad if you don't say hello or they think you're, you're good if you do. So, um, and then I remember one day I was doing a field visit really remote with uh, one of my colleagues and um, on a motorbike and he, he dropped me off in a, in a field outside of a school so he could bring a client home. And um, school let out. So there was like a hundred students that surrounded me. Uh, they were crying, they were laughing, they were fighting. Um, they were calling me funny foreign names. <laughs> and yeah, I thought this is like, it, it was such a kind of life-changing day. I went, went back to my, to my host family's house and I wrote in my journal, I said, every day we change forever. Um, and that happened that day and it, it really happened every day. I was in, in Kenya and I started to look at every day a little bit differently than I did before that experience. Um, I think every day you have a chance to make a new connection or, or um, yeah, really change your, your life forever. So, yeah, and then uh, I, I definitely caught a, a travel bug after, um, after Kenya. So I'm looking forward to going back. It's been a long time and I really want to go back to East Africa. I think it looks very different now. How yeah. is your Spanish, by the way, now? Sorry? How is your Spanish? Still crap. <laughs> <laughs> so and then after this um you you opened your own company you co-founded Sprigle Consulting yeah this, what was it this was a, a funny adventure with my with my dad actually um but it wasn't the first entrepreneurial adventure I think like a lot of entrepreneurs I sold lemonade as a kid <laughs> um but I also I remember we also sold smoothies when we were like six or seven years old so we charged a premium 
Wow. The the flavor and the texture was very questionable, but the neighbors still bought them. Um, and then yeah, then I had a tennis tennis uh, company doing um, teaching and coaching tennis and stringing tennis rackets, which I guess paid for a lot of my sports equipment growing up. Um, and fast forward to Spriegel Consulting, it was on my you know when I first arrived in China, I was teaching and I thought I'm not going to just teach. It's quite a it was a, only 20 or 30 hours a week. And so um, my dad's an engineer and we found some projects where I could do some kind of quality control checks on the ground. So yeah, we did projects with um, environmental stove company, a bikes parts company, um, some distillery equipment and some other random projects here and there. But me, myself, not having an engineering degree, I felt like the business could only, mm. could only go so far. So it didn't last long? Yeah, it lasted a couple of years. It was kind of like always in the background. And I think it was always our dream, my dad and I, to start a business together. So I kind of checked that box, but it wasn't a unicorn status by any means. <laughs> <laughs> Did you come back uh, to, to that idea again a few, few less later? No, but it was an interesting way to um, start to visit some different smaller places in China outside the mm -hmm. big cities. Mm -hmm. um, And then your corporate world started, right? So you work for BI and then uh, uh, STEAM uh, Healthcare, was yeah, it STEM. the name? So, um, so STEM, yeah, UK-based uh, marketing company for, for pharmaceuticals. Um, What so, are your three biggest learnings? Well, Boehringer was, I never thought I'd end up in the healthcare business, but I got, um, I got hired to, to join a management rotation, like part of a localization program. And as much as I, I knew I wasn't going to stay in the healthcare industry, I thought it was an interesting way to go deep in China. So I was one of the first foreign sales reps selling mm -hmm. medicine at, at Zhongshan Hospital, <laughs> <laughs> which was a pretty, pretty crazy experience. Um, and actually, the, I mean, BI is where I came up with the idea for our current company, um, sitting through very long and boring classroom training sessions. Mm -hmm. I'm going through hundreds of PPT slides and looking around the room, everybody's on their phone. So I thought, why are we, why are we sitting here wasting all this money? Um, we could be out in the field and I thought there must be a way that we can, we should be learning uh, and, and this kind of content every day. Um, and then for, I mean, I'm grateful for the experience, but uh, yeah, it was, I knew that healthcare wasn't my, my calling. Um, and then STEM marketing was also kind of by chance because he, the owner of STEM was pitching my boss at Boehringer. Mm -hmm. um, my boss left and I thought, oh, I'll take this opportunity to pitch, this, pitch him this idea for Atium, even though we hadn't even, we didn't really have a business plan yet. And he said, it sounds like you're still working on your idea. Why don't you come help me open up shop in, in Asia? So I went from client side with BI to the agency side with STEM. Um, then STEM sold the company, and then I left to start uh, to start our current our current venture. Um, but I, I guess all in all, I think working at STEM and BI, outside of a kind of startup environment, definitely teaches you processes. It teaches you how to work with big teams, um, how to allocate resources. Um, yeah, so it's, it's definitely good to I think for any startup founder to also experience the corporate side. Um, even if it's through projects or full-time work, it was, uh, I definitely don't regret working in the corporate world. And now you're really good at PPTs. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wish I was better, but uh, I guess with PPTs, you're always learning how to, to make them more uh, aesthetically pleasing. And it's all about telling the story, right? You never perfect that. Right. So, and then after this, it was the last, your corporate experience and you decided, okay, so this is the time for me to go back to entrepreneurship. Yeah. And uh, I know that you've been through China Accelerator, yeah. and then also you're part of EO, which is Entrepreneur Organization uh, Accelerator as well. So can you give a little bit more um, information about your time at CA and uh, OE pros and cons? What did you learn? What did you like? What you didn't like? Yeah, I mean, some of our advisors have kind of questioned, do you need both programs? And I think what I've seen is they both offer, there's obviously some crossover, especially in the, the the members of both programs. It's nice to hang out with lots of other entrepreneurs. Sometimes you can only talk about certain challenges. 
and tribulations with other entrepreneurs because you don't want to burden your friends sometimes talking mm -hmm. about business um, every time you meet. <laughs> and um, I think for CA, I, my, my regret is that we didn't join a little bit earlier. We'd mm -hmm. already been established for a couple of years and we, we went into the program with quite a few clients and I think some of the you know, the lean startup methodology, business model canvas, et cetera, would have been quite useful in the early days for, for Atium. Um, so, yeah, and I mean, C CA is, has been, people think of it as just a three month or six month program, but actually they've been supportive for the last several years. Um, we still meet them regularly. Um, we have advisors, mentors, coaches that have come out of the, out of the program, so. Um, and then with EO, it's, they, they work off of uh, the scaling up framework mm -hmm. from Vern Harnish. And it's not as regular in terms of the learnings, but we, we, we have quarterly learning events. And then we, the big part of EO is the accountability piece. Mm -hmm. So you're held accountable to a group of fellow entrepreneurs and a coach. Um, and I find that kind of structure is, is quite complementary to the support we get from China Accelerator. Mm -hmm. So I'd say luckily we're not, none of us are solo founders in our company, um, that we have some great, great partners. It's also great to have partnering organizations like EO and CA. How to get there? Sorry? How to get there into the Accelerator? Um, China Accelerator has minimum revenue slash traction um, variables or metrics and, mm -hmm. and same thing with EO. Mm -hmm. So if you're a solo founder and you don't have any clients yet, it's quite difficult to get into the programs um, unless you've raised a big capital and you have like a proven idea. Mm -hmm. um, but it really depends, I think, on the, the time and the location of the, like for, for EO, it depends on the location that um, you're planning to join the organization. Now let's um, talk a bit uh, about your baby, about Atium. How did it start? It? How did you come up with the, with the name? It's actually quite an interesting name. Uh, how, 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 how business is going and what problems do you solve? Uh, who, who are your clients? Yeah, so we were originally called Accelitrain, but uh, it's too many syllables, difficult to spell it's under pressure. Hard to remember. Some of our clients still want us to go back to the name, uh, but ultimately we didn't want to end up as just a training company. We're really trying to evolve into the engagement space. Um, so we changed the name to Atium. It means the, is after about 100 to 1,000 different names that we put on the table. But um, the meaning for us is like the coming together of matter and spirit or bringing managers and their, their frontline employees closer together. Um, so yeah, like I said, it was, the idea was really a result of that time at, at Boeinger. Um, sitting through long classroom training sessions, I thought, well, how can we break this up into bite-sized training modules? And so if we're talking about just the training piece of Atium, it's really like, um, you, do you know Duolingo? Mm -hmm. It's kind of like right. Duolingo for corporates. Mm -hmm. um, so now we're evolving into engagement communication. So we've launched some really interesting um, features over the last few months, company Newsfeed, community forums, we just launched a survey builder. So all of these things are, are meant to support like peer-to-peer -peer training on the ground, peer-to-peer -peer communications, helping you know, give the frontline teams a voice. Um, and I think through COVID, we really narrowed down our focus on frontline teams. So if you think about large workforces, um, mainly working remote, that's where Atium is working very well. So, yeah, we're working with some great clients. We've, we've got um, Jones Lang LaSalle, uh, the Executive Center, Man Oriental Compass Group. So now it's just about, it's really about scaling the, the business that we, that we have. Um, and then who knows, in the future, I think we'd like to do uh, more machine learning, AI, mm. VR type of feature sets. But right now we're, we're sticking to what works well. I'm curious, how do you pitch to, to, to big corporates? So you come up with the PPTs or, or how does it work? Because this is not something that I guess easy to sell, right? It's not yeah. something tangible. Yeah. So it should be a lot of education around it and then basically just narrowing down 
uh, going for that specific one thing that they are okay we have this pain yeah so this is a big learning for us is that although we can do many things for a company and even the champion might see all of the potential possibilities for the business we need to narrow down to a specific use case mm -hmm. so we always talk i mean in, in startup world you're always mm -hmm. talking about minimal viable product right so when we go to meet the group of stakeholders, we talk about the minimal viable project. Mm -hmm. um, they want to know that we can be successful in a very specific pain point to help them, like, to help them solve a very specific pain point. And then it's very easy for us to scale in different directions from there. So with a lot of companies, we're focus, focusing on compliance or health and safety training. Mm -hmm. So automating some of those training processes and data collection to make sure that the, the company is not just checking a box, but they fully understand the health and safety, standard operating procedures, you know, compliance, rules and regulations. Um, and then we can go into some of the more fun stuff like you know, upskilling or um, employee engagement. So all those tool sets are available, but we try to stick to a specific business case before, um, before we go deep in the organization. That also means starting with smaller teams. Um, so we we have you know we do a proof of concept for two to three months, show the stakeholders and the company that it works, and then we grow from there. So you've been working with lots of corporates. What are the common challenges they have, like the patterns that you already kind of identified? And okay, this is the a good um, clients for us. So again, large workforce, remote working teams, even remote before COVID. Um, and the other one is just really around communication. So we have WeChat, we have email, we have WhatsApp throughout the region, but um, the problem is you can't track who has read what and also you can't check for understanding. So you can't check for understanding when you share a training or communications piece. There's no, there's no way to really measure a shift in performance or a behavior change. Um, you, can, you can't even see if they've read the new rules and regulations. How do you know if your company's safe from breaking the, the law? And something you definitely don't want to do in, in China. Right. So, so you say you're going to go into the more like the AI and more more technology, right? On technology side. So, how much is technology actually right now involved? Are you a technology company? Yeah, I'd say we're a technology company, but it's still. Um, I mean, it's full suite of tools. So I think our next step technology speaking is to is to work on some more plug and play solutions mm -hmm. because right now we're we're a standalone app and we can integrate with other platforms but we want to we want to break down our our suite and offer some plug and play technology because a lot of the big companies like your fortune 100 they already have existing hr platforms that they mm -hmm. really want to leverage especially from the it perspective they want all content and data to flow through the same through the same ecosystem. So that's a challenge as, as well as a, an opportunity for us to, uh, to grow the business. Based on uh, observation that you, you had over this past years doing the business, um, so most of the clients you have, they are MNCs, right? International, yes. Multinational companies. Yep. Have you tried to work with the local companies? And if yes, what are the challenges and what are the difference between MNCs and local companies? Um, we have worked with some Chinese companies uh, but we find it's really, really difficult to convince a Chinese company that we're a better uh, service provider than a, than a Chinese competitor. Um, yeah, competition is already fierce enough with uh, Chinese companies. And we found it's a, our sweet spot is with multinational companies that you know, leverage the speed of China to test new technology and, and, and bring it outside of China. So it's... It, it serves as a really good testing grounds for us, for multinational companies. And now we see a lot of our clients bringing us outside of China. Um, the other issue is that we're not, we're not in the, we're on the sidelines of the WeChat and Tencent ecosystem. And mm -hmm. most Chinese companies are very much in, in bed with these guys. So it's, um, yeah, it's quite challenging for us to convince them that we have the right solution locally and for, for spe a specific market like China. So potentially the, the company will grow um, outside of China, right? That will be kind of next step. Yeah, we already have. Actually, this year we, we're now in 13 countries. Oh, wow. Yeah, so the first company to bring us outside was, um, was Compass Group. They brought us to Singapore and, and Kazakhstan. 
And again, like once you get the, the foundation business case or the kind of case study, the successful case, you, you, it's easy to convince other regions that you can do the same thing for them, especially with like a safety first, compliance first organization. I mean, they all have the same ethos and mission, you know, zero accidents, 100% uh, safe work environment, actually even before revenue. Um, so if we can prove that, that, that our, our system helps assure that the frontline teams are up to standard, it's quite easy to convince the other regions that it, we can do the same thing. So since we already started talking about local companies, right, and uh, about the local market, um, the next question would be um, specifically for, for us foreign entrepreneurs here in China. So we've been here already for a while. Um, how much the market um, has changed uh, in, in the past five, six, seven years? Um, is it getting easier to do business or is it getting harder to do business? I think it's getting, it, it's still an exciting place to, to, to work, start a business and to live, of course. Um, but it's definitely getting more challenging. I mean, across, we work across several different industries and, and we're in the startup ecosystem. So we see a lot of localization in terms of who's being hired, which um, you know, third party companies are being hired to do projects. And yeah, I think it's, a, it's definitely a difficult environment for, for foreigners, but that doesn't mean there's not um, opportunities here. I think there's the speed of the market, the talent here. Um, I mean, if you're smart and if you follow the rules, then you can definitely still make something happen here. But I'd recommend uh, anybody that doesn't speak Chinese to, to learn Chinese before you that's a good one. You do business here or in it's parallel. Must because, have now. Yeah. Not an option anymore. At least at least try to learn because if you speak zero, you it's almost um, zero success rate, I think, right now. Unless you're maybe a diplomat or something. If, if I think if you're not planning to stay here for quite some time, right, then probably it doesn't matter. But if you're trying to build a business here and you're going to be here another five, ten years, then um, without Chinese, it's going to be really, really hard. Yeah. Uh, what's your next big milestone, personally and uh, work-wise? Personally, I need to get home, and uh, my one sister just had twins, so I want to go meet these two nieces, and uh, then my other sister's getting married, so yeah, I hope I can just get home safe in December and, and catch up with the family. Um, and then professionally, business-wise, I, I mean, we want to continue to expand through, through Asia Pacific and, and Central Asia. Um, we have big plans to, to grow outside of China, and Right now, it's down to, I think it's down to execution. We know what we need to do, so, yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, I wish you best of luck. Um, I wish you to have a safe uh, travel back to the U.S. and then see you again after, I guess, Chinese New Year Thanks, back Mary. in China. Um, that was In China Between Meetings with uh, Matt Spriegel, founder and CEO of Artium. Thank you so much. Please click, subscribe, share, like, uh, comment, and see you next time. Thanks, Brian.